welcome. Hi, I'm Mickey and this is Wikipedia, where I sit down and chat to doctors, professors, athletes, practitioners and experts in their fields related to health, nutrition, fitness and well-being and I'm delighted that you're here. On today's podcast, I sit down and chat to my mate, Professor Grant Schofield. So Grant is the director for the Center of Human Potential at AUT University, and he also runs Precure, which is a social enterprise that exists to inspire medical professionals to do health differently. And that's alongside his wife, Dr. Louise Schofield. Now, Grant is well known in New Zealand, Australia, and internationally for anyone who is um, has any interest in the low carb, healthy fat scene, and is the author of the four best-selling books in the What The Fat series alongside Dr. Karen Zinn, another great mate of mine. So today, Grant and I basically talk about Grant uh, and his morning routine, what he's learned, how COVID was for him, so many different things. And it really is just a, a, a great conversation and it was an awesome opportunity just to catch up with Grant. So I will be posting uh, links to uh, where you can find Grant in the show notes for this week's podcast. And other than that, uh, sit back or wind train or continue to run, whatever it is you're doing whilst you're listening to the podcast and enjoy this conversation I have with Grant Schofield. And we're on. Hi, Grant. Hi, Mickey. How are you? Pretty good. You? <laughs> I'm good. Do you know, the funny thing is, is that as soon as like I hit record, I suddenly feel awkward. Like I'm yeah. talking to Professor Schofield and I'm not just talking to Grant. That's weird. Hey, did I tell you I've been following you vicariously? I've been living vicariously through your running by following you on Strava. Um, and every day I get to see what you've done. It's sort oh. of cool. Oh, that's awesome. Because it's been so long since we've actually just had a yarn, really, isn't it? Because I think yeah. last time we spoke was um, I was doing the pre-cure um, lecture slot for your health coaching students. Oh, yeah, that was awesome. It was. And when I think of you, I think of all of the things that you've done in your relatively short time on this planet. And I often wonder how on earth you've actually managed to like, fit it all in. Yeah, I was wondering it myself because I'm inherently quite lazy. Yes. You know, like left to my own devices, I just don't really give yeah. a shit and I, and I don't bother doing anything. So I'm quite surprised that I achieved anything, frankly. Well, do you know, and you will know this because it was just in the Herald on Saturday, um, yeah. I've followed a lot of Dan Lieberman's work over the years and his theory, and I wholeheartedly agree, and, his, and what you've just said is me to a T, but as humans, we are inherently lazy. Yeah, I love Lieberman, and there's a, a couple of really good books I read about uh, he's written. Uh, he's called, cool. yeah, is that right? It's, it's good to be saying that because I feel better about myself already if, if actual gurus at Harvard are saying that. Yes. Then, then we can bear it. Yeah, t totally. Because the whole theory behind that is, and this makes perfect sense, and you'll think so too, is that, you know, it was, has always been our, in our best interest to conserve as much energy as possible. So, why would you, so, you know, in order to, because you had to conserve energy to go, then go fight for your life, run for your life, forage and gather food, not just for you, but potentially for your offspring and their offspring and things like that, yeah. that it was in our best interests to, on the flip side, uh, pretty much do next to nothing. And, and if you look at the physical activity levels, I don't know, have you ever looked at this research grant? of kind of like indigenous populations now versus... Oh, yeah, that's sort of it's a little bit more cyclic. Eh? Like, I'm actually having to find food, they're active, but besides that, no one cares. 
Yeah, Spies totally. Yeah. yeah, and then and they kind of looked at the physical activity level of the kind of native tribes was about 1.9. And yeah. for us as modern humans, it's, it's about 1.6. So that's actually not that, not as much as what people would expect it to be. Yeah, and I guess it sort of averages a bit misleading because they're probably like, bombing it out at like 5.5 or something and they're down to zero point nothing totally um, after they had a good feed so that's interesting whereas we're sort of yeah. feeling we have to go to the gym every day or something yeah and i don't know how you feel about it but this often helps me think about people who i would love to see get out there and be active the way that we are you know and i yeah. i have this like in my head i'm like part of me is like how can you not get out there and and, and i feel a bit sad for them they don't enjoy they don't get this kind of pleasure that we get from that exercise so that's part of my thinking but then part of me like having kind of learnt this stuff from kind of dan lieberman his lab and that i've i've now you kind sort, of thought sorry, you sort of get it you get it a eh? like this yeah. is not the default like just because we surround ourselves with people who want to get out there and get amongst it yeah, is, well, I think one of the reasons I'm active though is like I'm quite easily bored, um, and yeah. and so like if I wasn't, there's only a certain number of things I could conceivably do do during the day, yeah. um, like sleeping was only a certain amount of that you can do, um, yes. eating was only a certain amount of that you can do, yeah. um, hanging out with your family there's only a certain amount of that you can do, um, and, and less working, some days. yeah, yeah, and working there's only a certain amount of that you can do, um, yeah. yeah, there's actually not that much left for me so I like um and I quite like being outside moving around and just looking at things and um yeah you know, and doing other activities so I just can't do that and then I and and sometimes as well just because of my general laziness um yeah. I find it a really good place to think of interesting things that like my job yeah. depends on often me thinking of interesting things um yeah. and also I find it's quite a way sometimes I listen to um not always but sometimes I listen to um sort of podcasts that I find quite interesting um, yeah. So it's a good way of learning as well. So it's like it takes all these boxes without too much effort. Like there's no way I'm going to sit down and listen to a podcast. It's just not going to happen. I, oh, like I can't yeah. concentrate. I can't concentrate that long. Yeah. And um, and I'll just fall asleep. I literally yeah. actually will fall asleep. Um, yeah, yeah. So so that's it's, it's, that's one of the reasons I do all that. You know, that's me as well. Like I, my favorite part of the day. So, and I'm going to ask you how you kind of do this because I love a morning routine. I love Tim yeah. Ferriss talking to people about morning routines. And then I yeah. love reading Tim Ferriss's book about people's morning routines. Like I'm a bit obsessed to be honest. Oh yeah, by morning routines. Yeah, yeah. I've been thinking about, I've been anticipating it because you said you wanted to ask me about that. And I was like, oh, well, I was a little bit in awe because I would always look at your morning routine because you get up earlier than me yeah. and you go running. Yes. And, um, and I tried that a few times with you over the years, um, and it, I just don't really like it. Not that I don't like going around a view, it's just that what I've come to understand is that I think we're different chronotypes. So, like, like if it's dark in the morning, yep. I, I'm asleep. Yeah. Like, that's what I'm doing, right? Yeah, so, yeah, that's yeah. the way my body works. Yeah. And um, you're, you're not necessarily. No, and it's interesting. So, and I know, you know, I like, as I said to you prior to coming on the call, you're my first cab off the rank. So I don't know who's going to be listening to this, but if someone's listening and they're not sure what a chronotype is, Grant, do you want to give us just a little... Oh, so definition? it's just, just this idea that, um, first of all, within a person, um, when you go to naturally go to bed and wake up, changes mm -hmm. through your life. So And, and the duration of that changes through your life. So when you're, when you're really young, uh, you know, preschooler and... and at, school then you can sleep you know 10 12 hours a day um mm. you can go to bed at eight and then sort of get up typically reasonably early mm. uh and then as uh, as you shift into teenage years there's, there's actually a chrono shift so yes. um and more for boys than girls but for both so that yeah. this is actually a thing they'll go to bed much later and sleep in it's a real thing um yeah. so much so that actually what's interesting about that is um when they have schools, particularly in the US, that start at different times. Yeah. Um, like there's seven thirty starting schools and nine o'clock starting schools and all that sort of stuff. Mm. When schools have changed their start time to being later, they've seen mm. th something like a hundred point increase in the SAT scores with no mm. other intervention. So, so you know, yeah, working it's a real thing with teenagers. Yeah, so yeah. Working with that. Um, but then in adulthood, when it all settles down, um, there's there's fifteen to twenty percent of us who are who are um, larks, like is that yeah. you? They 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 activated early. They get up. They're sweet. Yeah. They're good to go. Um, yeah. And there's 15 to 20 percent that are night owls, um, so they're completely useless in the morning, and then they mm. seem to be good later at night. Um, and then there's the majority of us, which is me, 
which we're both useless in the morning and at night. Um, and there's a brief period during the day where we're actually onto it. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and so for me, um, like exercising later at night or early in the morning, is just, uh, I just can't do it. Um, oh, and, yeah. and any sort of thinking I can't do either. Yeah. So isn't that interesting? Because for me, so I, that whole chronotype thing, um, topical, because I was actually just listening to a podcast the other week. Matthew Walker came on, Peter Atia again. Love that oh, yeah. show. He's, he's a legend. He's, he's, that Matthew Walker is just a, a, a communication about sleep guru. So if anyone hasn't listened to him, I absolutely recommend that. And his book's good as well. I read that. Awesome. Well, actually, the one thing, though, about his most recent podcast, he was using the metaphor around sleep being like, it was all related to food, like the buffet, you go in and go out. And as I was running, I just didn't have much of an appetite. And he continued to kind of refer to it because I like you, I love listening to podcasts when I run. It's how I learn. Um, and I was just like, oh, this is actually making me feel a little bit <laughs> nauseous. Yeah. But um, what I loved about what he was talking about, which is so in line with what you, how you just described it, was that that modern day society is actually, it goes against those night owls. You know, they're actually up against it with the way that we have lived our lives. Yeah, yeah totally. Because, because, because the larks, the mickeys of the world, are uh, held up in sort of, uh, in, in sort of victorious honour. Look at them. Look at this. Look at how they go. And they're up early and you dress you lazy bozos. Are just... <laughs> <laughs> You're lazy so, yeah. ass. What are you doing? <laughs> That's right. And, and it's, particularly selected against them in, you know, structured work environments. Oh, um, totally. I think the world's changing a bit to allow for that, which I think yeah. is a good thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. It is in part, like, it's the, it's and interestingly, just because we are on sleep, and I'm sure that you've um, listened to this as well, he was talking about some recent research that's come out in and around COVID and yeah. sleep patterns, like people are sleeping like a little bit longer, but aren't necessarily actually sleeping any better and yeah. i've heard people talk about like uh that they feel yeah they are sleeping more but not so refreshed and actually are just a little bit depressed yeah and i think um to me like they didn't talk about that this as much but to me the the interaction here is alcohol yeah. and sleep and i think for many yeah. people alcohol consumption has gone up in yeah. covid yeah. um like i'm currently on an alcohol free uh period at the moment simply because nice. it's an increased yeah, yeah. During the the lock these lockdowns to the point where yeah. I was actually drinking more than I would have liked, and I think um, yeah that that sort of well known effect of alcohol, particularly on dream sleep, is a is a thing. So yeah, alcohol absolutely. doesn't it might make you sleepier, but it doesn't have a positive impact on your sleep. It's worse, and I think that's in a direction. Yeah, I agree, Grant. And it's interesting because I think some people might use the alcohol because of this blurred work home environment. That's yeah. almost like they're drawing a line in the sand. Like it's five o'clock, it's time for wine. Yeah, I'm not I'm working getting anymore. Off my, I'm not working anymore. So this is what I do. Um, yeah. Despite yeah. the fact that they'll probably jump on their computer later on in the evening time and catch up on some emails because it's right there, you know, like, yeah. so I think part of it is yeah, absolutely the world is moving to a new way. And it's that having to try and find that balance between some of the really, the good things that can come of it. Yeah. And then some of those other, you know, um, less helpful um, and not, not just in terms of alcohol, but the, the kind of expectations around what's required from a work perspective and how that might impact negatively on, you know, people and things and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I've been sort of thinking about work and stuff quite a lot. Really. Yeah. Uh, cause I, cause I'm sort of look at unis and I, I look at universities, which I've worked on my whole life. Yeah. Um, and I sort of then look at new ways of doing things, the way that sort of virtual technology has taken off. And um, we're so old school. Oh, uh, and I just go, like, how come we're so useless? Um, yeah. How can we, you know, like, like yeah. our, our, our adaptation to this world has been slow. Um, yeah. I still reckon... What do you reckon about this? Um, so the thing is for uni, so the reality is that the majority of the fee is not paid by the student unless you're yeah. an overseas student. So the reality is in New Zealand, for example, the Tertiary Education Commission pays 80% of the fees. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's actually quite a lot of money. It's like you know, 32 grand, depending mm -hmm. on what course you're doing, a year. Um, mm -hmm. if, if the student had to pay the whole lot, but not only the whole lot, every time they had an interaction with the university that was going to cost money, like email from your lecturer or uh, yes. thing, they had to actually pay in cash. Yes. They would all run their credit card. There'd be a complete uproar. That's like, what do you mean 500 bucks for that email? 
hundred percent agree. Yes. They would just go. Well, they would just go. Nah, we're not doing it. And also, it's just like the customer service. Like, you know, can you imagine a shopping mall where, yeah. um, where they, the shopkeepers' cars were parked out front, and if you wanted to park for the, as a customer, well, you just pay your own way or make your own way wherever you could, which is basically the university <laughs> way. Right? It is. You're so right. <laughs> uh, so it's just a complete lack of focus on the actual customer, ripping them off yeah. the extraordinary amount of um, cash for what we deliver. Um, totally. You know, private enterprise will kill them if like, they're not careful. Um, oh, so, mate. You know, and do you know interesting with that as well is that there's there's also this kind of cognitive dissonance with a lot of students because what you're saying is 100 percent correct that they're only paying a small amount um toward their education but actually yeah. um they're not even a lot of them aren't really paying that right now you know and so no because they can defer it and it's and so they're paying nothing yeah um, yeah in their eyes they're paying nothing this is free so it doesn't matter whether they turn up or or not come, or they miss go, this yeah. assignment totally yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that is um, a big, di a big kind of um, discussion. Um, and we at Unitech, because of course, I think Polytech is a, li a little bit different from university in, in the, the kind of student that we attract and our yeah. kind of level of support and what we can do in a small program. Like it's quite different. It yeah, is a little bit a more, more like PTE. Give a bit, bit, yeah, give a bit more value. Yeah, um, totally. Which is good. Um, universities get away with it, but more purely because of brand, you know. Yeah, um, for sure. Uh, and the bigger the university, the older the university, the bigger the brand. In my yeah. experience, the less they do. Yeah. Um, so we have to yeah. do a reasonable amount, but we're still not that awesome at it, um, and and others don't either. So yeah, yeah I've just been thinking about that recently because I'm just going, oh my goodness, you know, like, um, and 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 to get anything to the level of bringing it to a degree and it's teaching it some thing, you know, we we keep deciding new things are interesting, but yeah our ability to sort of bring them out. And you look at some of the older unis, what they're still teaching, you just, especially in nutrition, you just go, oh my God, how's that even possible? Uh, I know. Yeah. You know, we're really lucky at Unitech because we've got, a, I've, like as a nutrition expert, which yep. is, I don't really like the word expert because I'm constantly learning and evolving and changing what I think and feel like, oh my God, I know nothing. Like as an imposter think, syndrome thing or something? Yeah, a little bit like that. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're the last one for that. That's hilarious. But that um, is totally it, right? Um, yeah. But I have a lot of autonomy on my course. Like, so, yeah. so one of our papers, one of the reasons why I'm, I was investigating Dan Lieberman is my whole interest in kind of evolutionary biology and, and le taking lessons from the, the, from the past and how we can kind of take them and, and insert them into modern day and what can we learn and how can we kind of move that forward? Whereas yeah. if I tried to teach that in a different setting, I think it would, I'd probably come up against it a little bit with regards to Oh yeah, because your colleagues would value. wrap you for a start and you would be the senior one and there'd be professor this and professor that just like all over yeah. you. Yeah, yeah exactly you what know, happens in, a, in the ivory tower. Grant, I do feel, this is actually one thing that I did want to ask you about. And um, so I'm just going to come out and ask it. Like, or, first I'll state that I think you, are one of the most misunderstood people in that kind of public space um, with, with regards to, I suppose, your level of authority in that nutrition space. Because the pushback is, if you don't do a nutrition degree, if you don't teach in nutrition or research, not research because you research in nutrition, then yeah. how do you know? Because you're not a dietitian, you're not a nutritionist. And I mean, I will say up front that I think that's bollocks. And I think you know that anyway. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Like, I, like, so for like that would that would wear other people down. I think, particularly because this has been probably the state of, as I see it. And and correct me if I'm wrong, but this hasn't changed a lot in the last seven seven years. Yeah, I mean, I think it's hilarious for a start. Like that particularly doesn't wear me down too much because I, um, oh. I, I also I said um, with Karen's in one time I was going so. Like, what's the secret code that you guys were taught? Because is it is it like something you can't tell anyone? That like you just you learn it somewhere. That like this is secret information. That and yeah. she is like half looking at me. What the hell are you talking about? Um, <laughs> but more recently, I've gone. If you were formally trained in in nutrition, yeah, um, and yeah, in the last few decades, mm -hmm. um, then in my opinion, that gives you a cognitive dissonance that appears to be a disadvantage. Yeah. Um, and in le learning something new, yeah. so so that's the thing. And um, what you do need to do, have, though, I think, is you do need a skill set of um, curiosity, mm -hmm. um, but not being curious isn't good enough. Curiosity, but you do need to have um, 
some fundamental and probably formal training in science of some sort. Yeah. Now, I was lucky enough that to have always been good at and been curious about human biology. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I've got a degree in physiology. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, and I've had a lifelong interest in that, particularly because I've always been interested in how the body works from an exercise point of view as well. So, yeah. Um, like I'm not completely naive to how the body works and how to do research and find out information. Um, yeah. And, I'm and how to interpret about information. Yeah. And, and do I always get things right? No, of course I don't. Um, yeah. Uh, and will I change my mind? Should I hope I change my mind? Cause not changing my mind would be bizarre. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. That, that sort of um, formal training thing. You know, the reality is, um, specific discipline stuff for, for professional practice mm. um, is constantly changing. And so whatever it was um, two decades ago is not even relevant. And if you're still yeah. doing that and you believe that to be true, then you haven't moved on. So, yeah, I don't know. I uh, just that's, don't really care about that. Um, yeah, that's great. It's not, Cause it's not a topic say, that beats me down. What, what, yeah. what, what beats me down yeah. um, is, is uh, ad hominem. Yeah. It's like um, he, this, is this thing, therefore – the scientific fact is not right. Like yes. that, that, that not only pisses me off, but it, 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 it does beat me down. Yeah. Like literally yeah. does. Like, like the like, science like, is settled basically. So yeah, the science is that... settled and this guy doesn't yeah. know because, yeah. um, or, um, or, you know, straw man arguments. So this current stuff with our COVID stuff is like, um, they're saying this, which you're not, I'm not even saying yeah. that. Um, yeah. yeah. They're saying they value, the economy over human lives, blah, blah, mm. blah. Here's a counter to that. And you're like, oh, for God's sake. You know, like that's what yeah. drives me batshit. Um, yeah, no, I is, understand. It's non-scientific argument to make scientific arguments. Yeah. So a couple of things on that, Grant. Um, firstly, with regards to being trained in that traditional kind of uh, science degree in nutrition, um, yeah. absolutely puts your blinkers on. And yeah. like I spent most of like up until my, I up until we got into it at AUT, so that was what 2012, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, I really thought that what I learned at university was gospel, and anything outside of that was um, yeah. was uh, um, the alternative view just just didn't fly. Like there was no science to back it up. So yeah. actually, then having that realization that actually I was the arrogant one who knew nothing. Um, yeah. That was, it wasn't actually that difficult for me. And maybe it was part of that imposter syndrome because you go around thinking you know nothing anyway. Then you actually find out <laughs> you don't know anything. You're like, oh, yeah. sweet, I was right. Um, yeah. But I 100% agree with that. Um, and the other thing, and I'm just going to skip right through to that last point around COVID and that whole, if you're valuing health or you're valuing the economy, like I just, this is what's wearing me down right now is that as a health practitioner who is out there talking to people about metabolic health, talking to them about the immune system and things that are important, you then see pushback from others who suggest that to talk about health in light of the economic, um, uh, the, the economics of it or in light of social demographic status is a place of privilege and we need to check our privilege because we shouldn't be thinking about vitamin D when there are people who are out there just, you know, who can't, don't have 15 minutes to go out into the sun or um, who, who can't access information to help support their metabolic health. Like it's this crazy, it's this, it's just such a strange time we're living in in terms of what is okay to say and what isn't. Yeah. Well, there's a sort of, um, well, let's just do, deal with those couple of things you said. The, the first thing I just wanted to say is there's, there's a really great example on um, no training, but actually end up knowing a lot. Um, yeah. And um, the best is, is a friend of both of ours is Bevan McKinnon. Yes. So, so, like, so like the guy's just extraordinarily smart, um, adapted <laughs> to do a whole lot of stuff across um, sports and a whole bunch of other things. Early adopter, biohacker, self-experimenter. Um, yeah extraordinary athletic results both from himself yeah when he's you know, and i hope Devin doesn't mind me saying this but his actual actual physical ability is not that awesome but you know he my god it becomes a world champion yeah, yeah yeah he's probably said that himself um and so 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 like there's just examples like that all over the place but that's just one we know you know like yeah like, so we can learn off that um the second the covid um stuff and the that you spoke about that speaks to a bigger issue in general and it's a public health problem um mm. one which would so you go like a good example is like 
um, if we put this nutrition program in, mm-hmm. the rich people will adopt it first and it yep. will perpetuate health inequalities. Um, yeah. And we can't, under any circumstances, um, perpetuate health inequalities. Now, yeah. the trouble with that logic, well, first of all, that's true. That could happen and it probably will yeah. happen. The second thing is on that basis, know what you, you end up being paralyzed into a space that you can't do anything. So yeah. if, if you did that, because imagine that same logic applied to um, early tobacco reduction. Mm. We've just discovered that, as it turns out, who knew, but um, inhaling you know, a thousand different poisons into your lung and holding it in there, doing, doing that 50 times a day for 50 years, um, is really bad for you, and it cu- kills you. Um, mm. and so we're going to let people know that, and not only that, we're going to start to put in programs and advertising and whatnot to stop people. Who stops first? Yeah. Well, the rich people. Yeah, totally. Um, with the most resources, of course they do. Um, yeah. But 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 can you imagine how abhorrent it is to not do anything? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, but and you need to catch up that tail. And we're still trying to. Fifty years later, we're still trying to catch up the socioeconomic tail because Murray women still smoke twice the amount than anyone else, and blah blah yeah. blah. Um, but but to have done nothing, yeah, is is morally reprehensible to a standard that's ridiculous. So to to have a virus that kills some people in the community and then not do your best to implement what you have at the time is, is, is more morally reprehensible than perpetuating health inequalities. And, you, and you, you're always chasing it to catch those up. And no one wants those, but you can't not have them. Yeah. So it's, it's a ridiculous thing. You know, that's, that's such a good way to just, and I've not heard someone describe it like that before, yeah. but a hundred percent that's yeah. it. And then alongside it is if we think about metabolic health, like, Absolutely, you've got Māori and Pacific in New Zealand who are disproportionately represented in those health yeah. statistics. Yeah. You, but, but there's also like the subsection of like we've got over sixty percent of our population is overweight. You know, like yeah. so across the board, if you can put into place something that is going to help some people initially, and then, and if as you say is correct, it just filters down. If that's the yeah. way that these things work. To do that, to my mind, makes more sense yeah. than doing nothing at all. So, yeah, completely agree with that. Hey, but we haven't spoken about this more. So, um, yeah. does it, h- how is it possible when we have $50 billion spent on this whole COVID thing, Yeah. Um, the only thing that individuals and communities can actually do anything about to, to protect themselves physically mm. um, from harm, from a from COVID is mm-hmm. to be metabolically healthy um, and, and supplement with some specific um, nutrients yep. that it's not even a topic. It's not a public, it's never, it's not in the paper. It's never not seen in it public. Discussed. It's not, it's not a thing. Like, have you, have you emailed Robert Scrag? Um, on the vitamin D stuff? No, I haven't. Yeah, I did. I didn't get a response. Oh, okay. But, I, I did. And I just want, it doesn't take like, like academics to get together to actually write something to the government to actually get someone to see it. I say, I'm asking you that. And then I'd actually like to see what you think. Because on a podcast I was listening to this morning, yeah. Um, yeah. what is his name? Glenn Gibson, professor out yeah. of University of Reading. So he's done, yeah. he made his name in pre and probiotics. And in fact, yeah. he coined the term prebiotic back in the 90s Um, and he they found early indication that pre that probiotics actually helped reduce severity of symptoms around um, COVID like COVID like viruses and also uh, improved recovery time right so on two aspects they were found to be beneficial for viruses like COVID him and two colleagues um, along with 125 other scientists, signed a letter, sent it to the health minister in the UK. Yeah. Nothing. Got, yeah, right. Didn't even get an acknowledgement. And subsequently, there have been clinical trials out of Italy. And look, I don't know to what extent these were of high quality trials. And I know there's been a lot of criticism around some of the stuff that has been researched or published yeah. at least. Yeah. Um, but he said subsequently, probiotics have been used in clinical trials in Italy. And I believe in China as well, although you know I'm happy to be corrected if I misheard that, uh, to show their efficacy in the space. And no one had, and the, what do you do? What Not do you only do? that, I'll, I'll give you another good example of, of, um, of probiotics yeah. in, in immunology. So there's, 
uh, with flu vaccinations. Of course, the problem with vaccinations for these sorts of things, and who knows what the COVID one looks like when it ever comes out, if there is such a thing, but mm. um, they're less effective for the most vulnerable. This is the whole point. You don't mount an antibody yeah. response to the to a vaccine if you're immunocompromised or you've got chronic conditions. You're not very good at it. And so, yeah. um, with a, the seasonal flu vaccine um, in this one study, that then men over sixty five, yeah. only about thirty percent of them mount any sort of decent um, uh, antibody response to to it, so to, it has any effect. So you know, seventy percent, nothing happens. Mm. Um, but they they then they then randomised those men to get some um, probiotics, and it yeah. moved up to 65, 60 or sixty five percent, I think, um, oh, effective nice. antibody responses. So like like um, it's just an astonishing effect, isn't it? I mean, you're doubling the number of people who are protected, uh, yeah. and, and it doesn't matter if it's a vaccine or if it's a real life virus. It's still about producing antibodies. So yeah. um, it's just a safer way of doing it, I guess. It's yeah. amazing, isn't it? That's so, it is such amazing. a big thing. Yeah, um, and, and like if you were to say put a, pre, a, a free prescription to, to probiotics, you know, or to vitamin D yeah. out there to people who are over the age of 65 or who are in the most vulnerable groups, like that's a pretty cheap um, way to i suppose ensure some level of uh, immune kind of um, resiliency or something like that that's right so selenium zinc yeah yeah vitamin d i think there's yeah. reasonable evidence some people say vitamin c but i'm not so sure about that uh yeah, and, and just general metabolic help lower glucose yes uh and insulin yeah. and yeah, we all have to do that so um that is a topic is an interesting thing i mean my view is that those should be the priority and i'll tell you why um like I don't see a vaccine coming anytime soon, mm. um, and and I don't see I don't see an elimination strategy as being realistic in the long run. I, you're dealing with a virus that's endemic; it, yeah. it's everywhere else in the world. Um, we we in New Zealand like to think we punch above our weight and we're doing this all special. And all that. It's just bullshit. Um, yeah. Like it, it will run it. It will eventually get out of control here. Um, yeah. And and if you're worried about being, you know, for, for most most of us, it's 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 relatively harmless. It's fixed mm. trivial, but there's a non-trivial um, group that needs to needs to consider their health, and we should be doing everything we can right now about that. It's just bizarre, isn't it? It's just bizarre. It it's not a topic. It just drives me completely nuts. In fact, I I have to stop thinking about it, yeah. and I'm not allowed to watch the news at home anymore. Like I'm <laughs> yeah. literally I'm banned from the news. Yeah. 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 Oh, mate, I completely appreciate that. And lockdown number two hit me way harder than I thought it would. Like it was, you know, and this is absolute privilege as well, because, yeah. you know, during lockdown one, I'm like, well, you know, four weeks, the weather's good. It's not that bad. I still get to work. You know, yeah. that is a level of privilege that a lot of people are not Correct. afforded. And I completely yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. And so when, you know, we got back down to level one, you know, part of me was a little bit nostalgic for lockdown. I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> just like to hang out at home with Baz all day, yeah, which yeah, is what yeah. I realized that's what that was. Because when I got word that we were back down in level three, I like, I like, I was just so unsettled and I was, I was completely flat for like two weeks. And yeah. I actually just thought, and that was the first time that I'd questioned the approach. And, yeah. and I'm not, and I'm not saying that in this kind of conspiracy way. And yeah. I got absolutely annihilated on social media for questioning the approach, but I did. And I'm like, well, well, but there this? needs to be, this is the trouble with social media though, is that any, the way it's sort of gone on this topic is that anything that's not the current agreed to sort of societal norm, yeah. um, even if it's a scientific viewpoint is then put into, everything that's put into the same category of being something to do with Bill Gates and, you know, whatever else is out there. Yes. Um, I think. Yeah, child um, trafficking and stuff. Yeah, whatever it is, you know, who it's knows? just like who knows. But but so yeah, that's a weird thing. Like if there was a time when you robust scientific debate, um, it's now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I got and, so angry. We, I, I, yeah. Tell you what I did. Like I got, yeah. I got. They, they extended that second lockdown. I found it hard enough anyway, and I was yeah. so angry that um, I knew I was just going to get on social media and vent or something ridiculous, and it would just mm. hurt me. So mm. I got on my mountain bike. And yeah. I rode along for about five k. So I got to this dirt road that goes up this massive hill that's yeah. like um, 25 minutes. And I just smashed myself as hard as I could to draw me into the, the, that next second. So I wasn't a yes. second ahead of myself. I even crashed and started bleeding oh, um, and just carried on, like, you know, ride till you bleed. But <laughs> yeah. I had to, um, I had to do it 
just to... It was that emotion. It's, it's that almost, but do you know what? I hear you. It's almost like I worried about losing my emotion, my ability to regulate my emotions. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. we deal with things differently. So you, that to me sounds like real frustration and anger. Whereas of course me, I just cry. Same thing. Yeah, right, right. But I cry and you yeah. go out and like ruin yourself on some kind of like mountain bike. Uh, yeah, mountain bike yeah, like ride. Just completely smashed it. Like I literally yeah. rode till I bled. Like. Yeah. It, it, do you know? <laughs> do you know? It's. I, I agree with you, Grant. It's almost like if you disagree with this, and I'm not saying that I dis. Like I'm not saying that right here that I absolutely disagree. I question it. I don't. Yeah. I, but you know, I'm not firm enough in my. I don't know enough to have a really strong opinion and put myself in that camp. However, if you do, then you're yeah. up against a team of five million. You're not part of the team, and I think that's yeah. what the rhetoric is. Interesting on that, um, when they had an announcement, um, a friend of mine was putting her thing on Facebook and she had like these shots of um, vodka lined up with her family and, oh. and they were playing like a bingo thing when they said team of five million, that was one drink, um, uh, go hard, go early, two, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they were like absolutely smashed by the end of that like 15 they, they minute were, announcement. Yeah, yeah, they only took five <laughs> yeah. minutes of talking and they drank the whole lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so look, I listened to a really interesting conversation with Cliff, Cliff Harvey and yep. uh, Simon Thornley the other week yep. on Facebook, all about the data and what it suggests with masks and, and where elimination strategy, where that um, the lockdown strategy has or hasn't worked and, you know, a whole host of all of the kind of data which which government is using to, I suppose, leverage their position and this is, you know, this is what we're doing. Um, yep. And it, like anywhere, it just doesn't seem like it's a settled science. And in fact, if anything, the way that Simon was positioning that data, and he's a smart guy, yeah. the opposite was true. So, like, just it, it makes it it makes it really difficult for the general public who are questioning things to actually know what the state of the science is. I suppose because no one knows, do they? Yeah, so I've been trying to write a blog at the moment. I've been doing this today and in the last couple of days. It's taken a while to come together because yeah. I, I think you're dead right. It's not like this or that yeah. um, is going to happen because no one actually knows. Mm. So I was trying to make it probabilistic. You yeah. know, like I reckon it's about, this is about 10% chance. This is about 30% chance. This is about 30% chance. But I don't think people will really understand that. Um, yeah. and, and it's only my guess at it anyway. Yeah. Um, back to yeah. that Simon thing. Like, like um, like I've worked with Simon Thornley for a few years. Um, mm -hmm. Like he's a sort of genuine, uh, basically, he's basically, um, this doesn't mean his position's right, but he's basically mm -hmm. the smartest person I know. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, he's a MD, he's a PhD in epidemiology, um, yeah. he's been involved in infectious and non-infectious diseases his whole life. Um, yeah. He makes some very good points. Um, yeah. He doesn't know the answers either. Yeah, um, yeah. But, but what you see in our mainstream media is um, if it's not on the playlist, then yeah. it's wrong. And yeah. that's just bizarre. That's just like not yeah. how science works. And, and so much so that um, there's a sort of a whole thing that was so, first of all, Simon might have noticed, but he did his performance review the other day and, and he was told to, he's not allowed to speak about this anymore because he's had yeah, the, the more senior academics aren't happy with what he's saying. It's like, yeah, he said uh, that on yeah. uh, Facebook, yeah. actually. Oh, so, yeah. Oh, I did. Yeah, yeah good. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and one of the most abhorrent in that is Rod Jackson, who's the butter guy. So mm -hmm. um, Rod and Simon have been going, who started supervising Simon's PhD thesis, which is on statins. And, you know, Simon found no effect, positive effect there. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, Simon went down the rabbit hole with saturated fat and started publishing on that. And they just came to complete blows about that. Yeah. Rod orchestrated the letter from, um, University of Auckland to um, sign by them saying that they shouldn't be saying anything on it. Um, and then Rod's been publishing stuff in the Herald recently and he, he just outlandish stuff going, um, only proper epidemiologists know what they're doing and this virus is clearly 30 to 40 times more lethal than COVID, than um, the seasonal flu, which it's not. It yeah. is more lethal, but it's not 30 to 40 times. It's just an order of magnitude, yeah, yeah. you know, you're 10 times yeah. out. Yeah. Um, I mean, the whole thing's just disintegrated into... Um, as usual in academic science, sort of academic bullying and um, one-upmanship and, and yeah. you know, dissonance. You know, everything that's bad about academia is playing out in this current thing. Um, you know, John Aedes, who's like pretty much the most famous epidemiologist in the world, 
from yeah. Stanford. He's been absolutely crucified and he is the smartest epidemiologist in the world. <laughs> um, you know, like, and he's yeah. doing actual active research in this area as well. And, and, yeah. and he's just, you know, and publishing it in the Lancet and the you know, New England Journal and everything. And yeah, yeah. St- still, still he's marginalised. Yeah. Yeah. It, it feels right now that, like, it's just going to be a long road, you know? And really funny as well. Like we were talking amongst ourselves with friends, like going, oh yeah, 2021. And we, you know, people are making plans for 2021. Like this is all a thing about 2020. And then yeah. once that clock strikes 12 o'clock on uh, New Year's oh, Eve, yeah. kind of New Year's Day, you know, yeah, oh, all back to normal. Yeah. Yeah, and, good, good point. You know, you kind of read like in the back, you know that that's not true. And actually I think it's dawning on a lot of people now that, you know, time is flying and we are like, that what we're experiencing now is probably, you know, this isn't going anywhere anytime soon. And that's, that's a hard thing for people to deal with. And the thing that I'm, and I was saying that I was feeling flat and um, not my usual self during lockdown. And I don't, you know, I still have kind of pockets of that if I think about it, but then I think about all the other people out there who are in far worse off positions to me and just the impact that this is having on our mental health statistics grant. And I don't know whether we are, whether there's been any research conducted in that space right no, now. No, none, none that anyone knows about just yet, but you know, anecdotally you'd have to say, oh, well, it's not, it's not that awesome. Mate, you um, need to get onto that, Professor. Yeah, I should, I should get onto that, yeah. That's yeah. a good point. Yeah. yeah. I'll tell you what you wouldn't want to be. Mm. Is, I know it's only a small amount of people do these jobs, but you wouldn't want to be a professional athlete. Oh, like, that would suck. Yeah, no. Like, or especially yeah. like, a, like my world, which is professional triathletes. Yes. Imagine that, like there's no events. No, I know. In any foreseeable future. Like, no. like, like that, that job doesn't exist anymore. You better go and do yeah. something else. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're talking to Bevan about, obviously talking to Bevan about that on uh, Fitter Radio. And, you know, yeah. initially uh, we saw lockdown. We, I don't know why I put myself in that. Um, they saw lockdown as, you know, an <laughs> opportunity. <laughs> it's, it's my constant, like, dream to actually be a decent enough athlete, um, yeah. triathlete, no less. Um, uh, you know, as a challenge, like, so, you know, block, uh, you know, you do like a run block, you do a bike block, then you do a yeah. swim block, yeah. then you do a run block, then you do a bike block. Then you yeah, well, then you enter a, an event, and then that event gets cancelled, and you're right. Yeah, yeah. particularly because so, their identity is totally tied up into being an athlete, and understandably so. You've been there. You're a professional. You were a yeah, professional but, athlete. Yeah, I coach a guy, uh, Matt, who's pretty good. So he's an age group guy. So always as a teacher, but like you know, he, yeah, yeah. he came. He led the swim out at Taupo. He was second oh. of the bike and came you know, third overall, I think. Oh, um, right. awesome. Yeah, like eight fifty. So he's, he's yeah. good. Yeah. Um, and it's getting better all the time. But it's like, yeah, right. Well, initially we did a bike block. Yeah. And then, oh, shit, we might as well do a run block now because there's not much happening. We might as well do a swim block. We did right. Yeah. So we've got one race yeah. in this duathlon at Pukakaui. Yeah. And, and then that was it. It's all off. Yeah. I mean, nothing. And I, I actually rang up last Friday. I was like, oh, I don't even know how to coach anymore. I don't know what to say. Like, just <laughs> do whatever you like this weekend. Yeah. I, I regret by Monday. We've got a list of events again. But, you know, who knows if they're going to happen. Um, I like that so you a, regroup by Monday and then give out yeah. your <laughs> nothing about him. You yeah, know, I, like, I had to regroup. Yeah, I was a completely useless coach, but it's like you know, you just sort of you just go, what am I supposed to? Have? What am I coaching you for? Like, what's yeah, what are we yeah. doing here? Like, we've, I've yeah. got through six months of blocks and this and yeah. that, and yeah, um, yeah, and I, I, I still that's still an important part of my world is to be able to do things like that occasionally. You know, like totally. um, events and. Yeah, and that's just all off. It's a bummer. Now, where are you with that, Grant? So you and I have a long history of like training together. And one of some of my fondest memories at AUT has nothing to do with the work I was doing, obviously. Yeah. Um, and more to do with the writing retreats that we went on, um, yeah. with us going on our kind of doing our half marathons before going to work in the morning. Um yeah, yeah doing our spin uh, sessions in the kind of pain cave at your house on her on street, yeah. you know, like those are the things yeah. which kind of warm my heart when I think about AUT, but yeah. you moved away from that when we started getting into the whole low carb, high fat, looking more at that ancestral kind of lifestyle and understanding a bit more about the chronic cardio overtraining type um space and i remember you and i were running once up birkdale road and yeah. you stopped and walked and this was in the early stages because yeah. you had adopted a phil maffetone math training protocol and your heart yeah. rate had gone above where you would have wanted to have seen it oh so, yeah I, like I, I i i don't know if everyone's life's like this but i, I sort of wish i knew what i know now back when 
I, yeah. I expect everyone to think that because they yeah. it's sort of fixed mistakes. But my thing is like I've I have had a couple of decades of absolutely smashing myself in, in elite mm. and semi elite sport and high level age group sport, both in um, triathlon and then in uh, running half marathon, marathon that sort of thing, um, which mm. I totally loved, but eventually affected my health quite negatively. Um, yeah. You know, I, I I think I've written about this a few times, but like. It, in the end, I had these um, lymph nodes in my groin the size of peanuts that just never went away and were like that for mm. like years. Mm. Um, and then eventually, I sort of got onto this nutrition, this the lo- low carb keto stuff as an inter- interesting intervention, getting fat adapted as an athlete. Um, mm. And that, that inflammation in the, those uh, lymph nodes disappeared in like two weeks. Wow. And, um, and I also had part of the reason, like I, I, I'm sort of slightly ashamed to say this, I don't think I've said it to anyone else actually. Um, part of the reason I was so active is, is that, like I always wanted to stay in shape, and that's yeah. that's one one of the that was the only way I knew how, and I yeah, yeah. always struggled to stay in shape. Like people might not think that, but you know, like, I worked damn hard to not not, not put on weight, and I put on weight yeah. so easily. And mm-hmm. so for me, um, the discovery that I didn't have to train so much, even though I like it, uh, was interesting. So I stopped doing that, and then and I I met Mark Allen. Who's who was coached by Phil Mathetone, the sort of seven-time Ironman champion, yeah. Mark Allen, um, mm. at the Hawaii Ironman at a pro briefing back in 1995. Mm. Um, and I actually had a broken collarbone in that race while it was partially healed. Mm. Uh, and so I wasn't in much shape. And I was actually sitting next to him and I asked him about his diet and training and stuff. Just thought, what, well, might as well, what have I got to lose? And he actually just was stopped and talked to me and told me about it. Mm. And told me about mafetone and the math yeah. method and uh, being fat adapted and low carb with some supplemental carbs when he was racing and um, this fat burning heart rate method. Is people not familiar with that math method about keeping your heart rate low enough that you're in that easy zone and you can finish these long sessions feeling invigorated, not tired. Mm. Uh, you know, the sort of immune and other benefits from that type of training. And I just didn't believe it. Yeah. So I knew yeah. that in 1995, and it wasn't until 2012, I guess, that I finally figured out that it was good. And then, so I've since reconnected with Mephitone, and I, I, I said, I said, oh yeah, I, I, I first learned about, I, I, I was Facebook for Mephitone. I said, yeah, Phil, I, I knew about this back in the 90s when you were doing it. Then he goes, I wasn't doing it in the 90s, but I was doing it in the 70s. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, so I'm just a massive fan of that. Um, yeah. For people who want to do endurance, at least, yeah, um, I, I think it's a much healthier way of doing it. I think yeah. you're in that space, aren't you? You're more or less in that space. Yeah, I totally am, and and definitely my thinking around it has evolved, as I'm sure yours has over the last kind of seven years. In that, you know, you kind of it almost takes going to an extreme view to then kind of bring yourself back to this level mm-hmm. of kind of pragmatism and and yeah, kind of yeah. reality on yeah, yeah whilst you might think that that is that that 100 zealous approach or zealous view is the approach to take actually if 0.001 percent of people are going to do it what's the point in talking about that you need to make yeah. things a bit realistic yeah. um so i definitely i'm but i'm definitely in that space as well i do remember grant walking into your office and seeing you sitting at your desk not sitting kind of half standing in one of those strange yeah. little chair things that you had um eating cream and whey powder and so uh, as part of your LCHF approach yeah. I, I <laughs> still do that. I still do that occasionally sometimes, you know. It's, it's like a, <laughs> that was going to be my question. No, the reason I do it is I've, 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 sometimes I get these like free, like Cliff one time I gave me a couple of his protein things and I got them for yes. free and then I got another one free. Like I get free nutrition stuff sometimes. So sometimes these whey protein things kicking around. And yeah. um, at our work they provide free uh, milk for coffee. Yes. Um, but we requested Red Top. Yeah. And so they they, <laughs> they, give, they give us free cream yeah. Yeah, um, in this big, massive two-litre container of cream. And it never someone's gets eaten. Someone's got to use it. Yeah, yeah, so someone's got to use it. So I'm sort of going, I, 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 so like I'm not crying poor or anything. Like I, I could go and yeah, buy yeah. much, and I do do that as well. But I'm just like, <laughs> I'm working, and I'm like, oh, screw it. I'll just have like, I'll, I'll make yeah. up a shake, and I'll put some yeah, whey in yeah. it, and I'll put cream in it. And then I'll just, yeah. it's like a keto shake. I'm not, like that's the most, shake. I'm not saying that's like the most nutrient nutrient dense healthy whole foods diet it's just like a <laughs> short lazy man's shortcut for <laughs> food yeah. in, in, in my office which i'm sitting at now actually i'm just looking at my whey protein thing over there which i just finished the last of the other day doing the same thing um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um 
moving on from your keto shakes, what is your general diet approach? Like, talk me through a typical day's food for you, Grant. Is there such a thing? And the reason I ask this is because most people are fascinated by what other people eat. And I mean, this is why basically nutritionists are obsessed with what other people eat. So, and and that's 100% why you get into the field. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's something that interests me as well. So, I mean, there's a more of a sort of um, wider approach is that. Um, in basic terms, my willpower is quite good. So yeah. like I go exercising, my won't power is absolutely atrocious. So <laughs> if we have like <laughs> like Doritos in the house, yes. um, then I'll just eat them. Um, yeah. So, so of course, because I've got teenagers and uh, other kids hanging around, then we do have some of that stuff just gets in the house. So I end up eating it. So um, what what's, I reckon if I was living by myself with no one else and I was in charge mm-hmm. of my food, I'd be quite good. Yeah. Like I'd be quite sensible with my food, but um, I drift in and out. So the, the the thing that works for me, now people are going to think this is quite random given this is actually my profession, yeah. um, is that um, I, I cycle in and out of being strict, like really mm. strict mm. Um, on particular ways of eating and experimenting with them. And then I sort of maintain that for a bit going out of that phase. And then I, I um, in my lack of moral fiber and laziness and weakness i drift back into um sort of poor eating so a good example of this is uh i in um or prior to this last lockdown so i think probably through june i was experimenting more with fasting and intermittent fasting in a whole foods context so i was made sure mm-hmm. i was fat adapted um mm-hmm. and i and i finished with a, a three-day fast or something yeah. um, felt great Mm-hmm. And then through that lockdown, I was just seemed a bit hungrier than usual. And then things, I started drinking alcohol a mm-hmm. bit more. And then I was having a couple of beers every night. Um, and then we just got lazy with the food. And then I was like having bread every day, like really. Mm. Like, uh, and I was not feeling that great. Mm. Uh, and then so that finished. And I was like, well, I can't continue. That's obviously not going to work. Uh, yeah. So I drifted back into now. And at the moment, I'm on my third day of a three-week keto challenge for myself. Cool. So it's like full keto, yeah. um, like s- strictly limiting carbs, no alcohol, yeah. Yeah. Um, all that sort of stuff. And so uh, this morning I had, uh, just as an example, what do I have this morning? This morning I had some scrambled eggs with some um, nice bacon and some avocado. Nice. Uh, I've had no lunch mm-hmm. uh, and for dinner, I'm not sure what I had, but last night for dinner I had I had a snapper, like quite a lot of fish fried, yeah. uh, with uh, a massive, massive salad um, with our homemade mayo, which is basically just egg yolks and mayonnaise. Nice. Uh, and, and olive that was oil. It. Yeah, yeah, olive oil, olive oil, olive oil, and and, and egg yolk, eggs. Yeah. Um, yeah. Make, making up the mayo, so yeah, it was just like. Uh, and that, yesterday I had for lunch I had a. Um, chicken salad again with heaps mm-hmm. of oil on it and for uh breakfast i had like four fried eggs but with heaps of coconut oil and um quite a lot of cheese on it um nice. and some some um hot chili sauce so that yeah. um and no no snacking it at all yeah. um strict yeah. so like i go through periods what what works for me yeah. um and it doesn't mean it's the ideal thing but some people have these diets where they go well i just do this and i do it all the time like karen's is really good like that Mm. She, she she's good at it but um i don't really have the moral won't power to to do that it's just yeah. not in me so I, yeah. I go strict and then cycle in and out of being healthy and then not so much um plus i'd I, say yeah sorry you go no it's gonna I, I, like sometimes like um as bad as junk food is for you and as much as i say about whole food like i really like beer and salt and yeah. vinegar chips like I, I really like eating them um, yes, yes. it's bad for me and i don't want to eat them forever but sometimes i like doing that do you know and it, it, some of my favorite things to do well a couple of the favorite things that i love is craft beer and a fat yeah. chip you know and yes, exactly. probably five or six years ago i would not have gone near either of them but i love beer now i like yeah. if like i'm sitting there at um like after dinner doing some work and i'm like to barry i'm like 
Baz, babe, we've got to get off this beer. So no, no beer for two weeks. And then it's like Garage Project hear me and they send an yeah. email to me and they're like, yeah. we've just <laughs> we've just released a new brew. And I'm like, damn it. However, <laughs> I'm saying that though, I think you and I are really different. So one, what I was going to say is Karen is the least obsessive, least, no. not she's a foodie, but she's so not an obsessive nutritionist. You know, like no. she's, the, she's one of the only nutritionists I know to not be obsessed with it, which yeah. has, is awesome. And the reason um, she does well is she just eats in a rhythm. She's just like, oh, I just eat the same stuff. Yeah, yeah totally. Um, and she's always kind of seemed to have a cue for when she's hungry and when she's not. And that's something yeah. which a lot of people don't have. And whereas I'm like the exact opposite in that if I am too restrictive, that's not healthy for me. Yeah. And I recognize that in me. And so um, what I have, and this sounds crazy for a nutritionist, I've never counted my macros before, never. Like maybe, maybe for a week when I was like doing a keto challenge and then I just got yeah. into the rhythm of checking the ketones. And so yeah. because of the amount of training that I've been doing and, um, and also just my, my age, like I'm 43 now, I'm like, you? you know, I actually, yeah, I know. Um, I have to start thinking more about my protein because this is what I tell clients all of the time. So I've been tracking my macros and it's been super interesting for me to see. Oh, how so what, what, were the, what was protein? Yeah. Oh, protein, 140. Actually, I've got a big appetite for protein food. And, oh, that's good to hear. Yeah, right. And, you know, I think it's heading back to my roots in the 90s with Bill Phillips and Body for Life. Like, that's right. where I cut my and teeth is that in this nutrition like a, space. Is that making up like a quarter of your calories or something? Easily. Oh, no, wait. I say a lot. That's a lie, actually. Probably around maybe 30%. Like, I've yeah. said it the absolute highest, and I tend to go over. Um, but oh, wow, what cool. I found is that it's actually, even though this is counterintuitive, counting macros, it, dare I say it, this is almost if it fits your macros, yeah. um, has been really liberating in terms of the types of food that people, that, that I've been eating. So, yeah. and it's, and like I say, like you constantly kind of tweak and, and learn things about yourself, I suppose. And yeah. sure, the older you get, the more experienced you get, the less this happens. But, but this has given me a kind of almost like more freedom around the types of food that I have. Because like you, I love craft beer and fat chip. Yeah. And you can kind of see how you, you can, people can have that type of food in their diet, to my mind, as long as they've got the, the basics right. And I think that yeah. you'll feel that, too, you'll know that too. And oh, yeah, for some absolutely. people, yeah. yeah, and the way that you're doing it is actually not, you know, on balance, it's just, if you were to have three days of rubbish and then four days of, um, of uh, kind of, you know, optimal awesome. diet, yeah. that, that's the same as someone doing the, you know, having an, fairly all right diet seven days of the week you know it's just what's going to suit you as a personality and make you adhere more yeah i think people need to do that so i like i i, I do worry about saying this to louise the other night about people who struggle with their food their whole life and and have trouble with this and then again i like they're going to be perfect and then they're not and yeah. then when they're not it all falls off it's just like like i i i'd much rather embrace i think the older i've got the more i've i've done better embracing my own humanity yeah. Um, cause I've got quite a lot of weaknesses, yeah. um, and I have some strengths, yeah. um, and I've got to work to those strengths. Now I can do things for periods really, really well. Um, yeah, yeah. um, and so I need to work with that. And so there were people who have that personality type and there's other people who just don't do that and they do much better as a more moderate approach over a period of time. And, and, you know, that's great. But I, I you know, I think, and, and so that we, earlier we we're talking about sleep. It's mm. the same thing. Like you've got to go with the type you are. So yeah. maybe there's an eating psycho personality type or something that, that could be a thing we invent. Yeah. Oh, uh, it could be. We could base it on uh, Gretchen Rubin's The Four yeah. Tendencies. Yeah, yeah. That would be you interesting. Know that stuff? I wonder if, has anyone yeah. done that? Has anyone done that? I, I haven't seen anyone. That. Like she talks yeah. about it in her application of it when she talks to people, but she hasn't actually talked about rolling out a yeah. study. Like that, along with some kind of well being survey around COVID. Those yeah. are two research projects right there, Grant. Yeah, that's right. That's because cool. because on the food thing, there's some people who actually are easily addicted to sugar and carbs, and this yeah. is like like they they just know that they need to abstain from them. 
yeah. in that sense of that. 100%. So there's that type and there's just different types there, eh? So, yeah. And yeah. particularly, in, and I, I guess, I think we've probably come along the same journey of when we embarked on LCHF and it was all very new to us. Of course, Cliff yeah. had been doing it since he was about five. Um, yeah. We, you know, we were like, you know, we were really like processed carbs are the devil. And I would have to say I've... I've loosened my stance on that, actually, because for some people, they are actually not the devil and they're completely fine. Having yeah, they've got a good, good source diet. of energy. Yeah, yeah, totally, right? And, yeah. and but, it's but just... for other people, if you've got you know, type 2 diabetes, it's like you probably should be a bit careful about it. You know, it's like, it's like yeah. there's just different horses for courses. Yeah, so, and I think like, you know, just like people talk about the diet of individuals, not, you know, everyone having a different, you know, not everyone following the same nutritional approach, the same person yeah. shouldn't follow one nutritional approach for the rest of their lives because their needs will change as well. Yeah, couldn't agree more. So that, that is a big thing that's not a topic either. Yeah. That's not really a topic. Eh? It's like, okay, yeah. I'm different now than I used to be or yeah. I need to yeah. reassess things here. What used to work doesn't work anymore. Yeah, I yeah, agree. Yeah. And I and I um one of my good friends, Lara, Lara Bryden, she wrote yeah. the period repair manual. She's got a book yeah. on menopause coming out. We're going to jump yeah. on for a Q and A with some questions, which yeah. um will be super interesting. She's such a wealth of information in that hormone space, and yeah. she's really good as well because she evolves her thinking around the science around females and hormones, and but not only the science but the application because it is one yeah. thing to study something in a lab and to find a mechanism or you know a route of action and and say well this is what we found quite different when you then have it out on the you know playing field or on the running track or in real life how does that play out because i think people forget that just because science shows us something doesn't mean that that's going to be the application of it in real life yeah i mean it's such an interesting area that whole thing unfortunately for me talking about menstrual cycles is about as credible <laughs> as me talking about about um how bats use radar to navigate you know it's like i was like yeah like you know I, 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 none of those things happen to me. no uh, do you I, know what I, I did see you get slightly uncomfortable on that couch ground i'm just kidding oh no 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 it's like it's like you know like if you get the actual details of menstrual cycles all of a sudden everyone's just like oh you know, well no it's just like where, where's it yeah like you, you've got to be a female to have any any Credibility. Idea well, yeah, yeah, or like, I was like oh, yeah. It takes a lot on. for people to know. Now, Bevan is one. If we go back yeah. to Bevan again, who's really taken an interest in this area for his because he has predominantly female athletes, so he's yeah, right. You know, he needs to. Yeah, he totally needs to. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Never... So his next step is to start getting estrogen injections. <laughs> I'm seeing him, him tomorrow. Saying, I'm, I'm going to tell him, him that's him. Professor Schofield's advice. Yeah, hey, well, Grant, you've, look. You've done cold water, you've done brown fat, you've done low carb, <laughs> you've, like, you've done fasting until you got, couldn't move because of the pain. Like, you need to do estrogen shots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Grant, um, very quickly, because I know you probably have to go, but I'm interested. You canned our call yesterday because of your cold water immersion therapy. Love that. How often are you yeah. doing that? Uh, yeah, it's been a surprising thing to me. I like so I first heard about this from Bevan McKinnon mm. ages ago, uh, and it's like, oh, you know, you start with this protocol, you have cold showers. So I started, I had one cold shower, and I was like, nah, this is yeah. ridiculous. He's not, yeah. yeah. Bevan was bringing in ice blocks from a fishmonger to his bath, you know, and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Next, next level. So I just like, gave up. I was like, that's just stupid. And Bevan's like, no, no, you can do it. And then, um, and then near the start of this one, I had a few friends who were just going, oh, no, 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 it's awesome. It's great. You get used to it. And it's really good for uh, particularly anxiety and, you know, mm. creating a whole bunch of things. And I was like, yeah, whatever. Um, and then uh, one lady I know who actually follows me more than anything in Tyra, this lady, Andrea, um, she and her friend were doing it. And, and then Louise was like, no, nah, we're doing it. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and so, so then I, this is about, I don't know, three months ago now so then i jumped yeah. in our pool which was 13 yeah. degrees i literally awesome. could not separate stimulus and response so i jumped in there and i was just like yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah it lasted about 10 seconds jumped out and yeah. i was like that's ridiculous and then i was yeah. like okay okay hang on that's not going to work for us so, uh, so yeah. i'm going to do a minute so we're back to the, 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 the minute and then i also discovered that this guy um uh oh, i can't remember his name, but the no, no, he was he wrote some stuff with Wim Hof, um, uh, but the book's called uh, The Wedge, uh, okay. which examines this stuff. And uh, Kobe, I think it's the guy's Kobe. 
Um, and it's a great book because it, 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 it uses at least cold water to start with to sort of look at the sort of metaphor of um, this wedge, this metaphorical wedge in your mind. So you've got the stimulus that's going to produce a, a, an automatic response, right? So you jump in yeah. cold water, you are going to hyperventilate, you are going to freak out, you're going to start shivering, you start going to freak. Yeah. Um, but the reality that was only designed for a life-threatening situation and the cold water mm. I'm putting myself in is not life-threatening. So you put a metaphorical wedge between that stimulus and responding, you breathe in um, slowly and deeply um, yeah. and you relax. And actually what you find is that you, you don't start shivering and you feel a sort of inner warmth and then um, get out and recover. And it made a massive difference to our well-being. So we started doing it nice. every day. And yeah. so then we were doing 10 minutes and then, wow. um, uh, so I've been doing it, I do cold water every day now wow. and have been for That's three awesome. months. Um, yeah. And and um, uh, and I think, like I'm the biggest cold water sook ever, it becomes quite addictive. Yeah. Um, and uh, like I went into the water yesterday and mm-hmm. it was 15 degrees and it's been 13 and I was like, oh, it's always mm-hmm. getting too warm for us. What's the point? You know, like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, 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 and I know it's been, um, it, it's been a real learning experience for me. And I, and I think, um, I think the, that what it teaches you is a, the difference, especially in anxiety, there's always a stimulus yeah. that evokes a response. Yeah. Um, now the stimulus isn't actually worthy of the response it evokes. Mm. So to better wedge between that and then reprogram because these responses are, are real, right? These yeah. are real responses to that stress. Yeah. Real anxiety and real real debilitation. Um, but it requires a degree of perseverance on just reprogramming that. And the cold water stuff is such an easy metaphor to understand because it's real. Yeah. It's pretty obvious yeah. that you freak. Yeah. And it's pretty obvious that you. Um, can easily separate stimulus from response and easily reprogram that thing and actually yeah. feel quite good about cold. I, I've, I, I did a, um, the best one we did was that we went mountain biking in Road Road just the other weekend. We went in um, the Blue Lake, which is, um, was like 9.9. Awesome. Um, so that is getting on the cold side of, of water. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but it's astonishing. You can float around there for like 10, 15 minutes and you just feel like you're a um, fire-breathing dragon and it's all sort of, this heat's oozing out from in you and you jump out and you're fine. It's like, Huh. Yeah, it's amazing, eh? And there are so many <laughs> metabolic benefits to it, as well as those, you know, the change in your vagal nerve and tone yeah, yeah, and, and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I um, I don't think there has been any studies because I've looked, but I've yeah. often recommended as part of kind of fat loss protocols that people jump in a cold shower as part yeah. of what they're doing. Um, yeah. uh, what I do is I um, brush my teeth at the end of the shower, and yeah. that goes for two minutes, and, and you do it um, cold. And do it cold, yeah. Uh, and um, I like I, I feel a bit kind of like I'm not quite sure I'm up to this today. But as soon as I do it, and you get over that initial um, pain of the cold, and I'm breathing really deeply, kind of almost in that hyperventilate, like not hyperventilating, yeah. but I'm trying to blow out a lot of the, my CO2 and, and stuff. Yeah. And you do end up feeling warm, like it is. Yeah, and and you want that trep- the trepidation of it. Yes, you is, do. Is actually the critical part of it. Yeah, yeah, because that's so that, kind of that's, that's the stimulus, right? Of your yeah, you need thing. to know that you, that's you able to, to overcome that. Um, yeah, I, I, the thing I find it hard about the shower though is like, like um, it's quite it's, it's it's a low cost to get there and turn it on, and it's quite easy to dodge it and turn it off. Whereas at least if you bother going yeah. to the sea, like you're there, right? Like yeah, totally. Yeah. You, you have you can't go home. It'll be awkward. Yeah, uh. <laughs> yeah. We we headed down to um the Blue Lakes actually this weekend, so um like. Barry is the biggest sook, so I don't think he'll be he'll be going in. But I, that because you've told me that you did it, Grant. Now that's like a bit of a challenge to me. Yeah, um, go in there. But, but one thing you shouldn't, though, I felt strongly about this. Don't like. I, I reckon in that lake, don't swim out of your depth in that lake. Yeah. Okay. Like, like because it's like not very floaty and it's yeah, quite okay. scary and it's okay. is cold and yeah. like you just get a cramp and that was the last we saw of Mickey. You know, like no, no, right. like that. If you've said that and you are <laughs> ex-professional triathlete, <laughs> that's enough to get me like just like kind of paddling in, sitting down on the stones, like yeah, yeah, kind of a foot it. deep. Hey, um, <laughs> um, one last thing before you go though, and this may actually take a couple of minutes, but yeah. I did start off by asking about your morning routine. We never yeah. actually got there. So, oh yeah, so the morning, morning routine, routine is just like um, so what happens is um, I've got I've got a border collie dog, Bluey, yeah. um, who I think is about nine now. Um, yes. So so at six thirty he wakes me up. Yeah. Um, 
like he comes to the side of the bed and he like puts his poor man is like and then he 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 moves like he needs to go into the kitchen so that because he wants to be fed at that point and he knows that's when he's allowed to do it yeah um so i jump up and um i feed him and i put the kettle on and yeah. um make a french press coffee and so we have that and uh just talk about how awesome we are um yeah. and Louise. and um, <laughs> oh, that's brilliant <laughs> uh and no we're not uh, and then Danny, who's our 10-year-old, because we've got a 19-year-old, a 17-year-old, and a 10-year-old. Um, I can't believe Danny is 10. Yeah, he literally bounces upstairs, and he's quite a chirpy kid in the morning, and he's like, morning. Um, yeah. yeah, and so he just generally, he still comes in our bed and, like, cuddles with us. That's not going to last much longer, obviously. Like, a 19-year-old's not going to do that. That would be awful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, so that takes us through to about seven. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then we'll just generally get uh, organised, get the kids' lunches made, you know, have a decent mm-hmm. breakfast, so I will cook up stuff. You know? Yeah. Well, yes. well, our kids get quite a lot of food and breakfast, like like yeah. smoothies, eggs. Like They might get three things. Awesome. To, to eat like quite a lot of food. Yeah. Um, like that's a big eating opportunity for us, our family. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and then so that everything will be done by eight. And what we would generally do is then go off to work at that point. But um, what we've been doing since lockdown, and we've just carried on with it, is between um, uh, this is going to sound this is privileged and decadent, I admit it. Yeah. Um, but it hasn't affected my productivity. In fact, it's enhanced us. So um, Louise and I will have, have a two hour period now between mm-hmm. eight and 10, um, which is dedicated towards exercising and doing that sort of stuff. Nice. Um, so we might do some resistance training together. We might go for a walk with the dog. We might do a walk with some cold water. Um, we yeah. might do a walk run with some cold water um, yeah. and so that's that and then it, um, uh, by 10 it's uh, it's actual solid work yeah. um, from then on with some breaks and I just try and achieve myself. I'm actually not really capable of doing more than six hours of decent work in my field a day. Yeah, um, yeah. Like I, I'm just not very good at anything past that. So yeah. like I work really hard for six hours and I reckon I can achieve more in that time than I do mm. by doing anything else. So that's generally how I would do it. Like, as I say, like I, I look at you and by the time I'm, sometimes I'm looking at Strava while I'm still in bed and it's like, you've already logged like 17 Ks or something. And I'm like, oh, how about that? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Yet, you know, at, when you're at your peak productivity grant, I am with lockdown. If I'm working from home, I am doing dishes and making dinner because my brain switches off at about from two to four. I am like, gone you know so, no, it's, so i'm it's, still cranking it then i'm still absolutely exactly. cranking it. like i'm yeah. doing my best so yeah. yeah it's interesting isn't it and and i like i just think that's the message for people is you've got to work with your chronotype and your eating personality and uh, what you're good at yeah like i'm um, trying to trying to work with what you're weak at it's just a it's a it's a it's a bad game it is, um, and it's a at, battle, and it, it, that will wear you down. You know, I asked you what will wear, what wears you down, Grant. Um, yeah. But that there, for anyone, if you're constantly fighting and it's a constant battle, yeah. you're not going to win. No, if I had to get up and exercise between five thirty and six thirty, that was my only available time that I had to do it then. Yeah. I, like I wouldn't do it. I can't. I, I, it would. We, I could do it. I could physically do it. I guess I could do it. Like anyone can yeah. do it. But yeah. it, it, I just can't. I just it would physically hurt me. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. In the long run, I just would give up. Yeah. And perhaps, you know, later on in my life, if I'm not having to do what I do in order to fit it in, I yeah. probably wouldn't get up as early as what I do. No, so I, so I don't reckon that's true. I, yeah. you, you were doing that, even, like I reckon you would anyway. Like I reckon it's in you. I, I, I just think you, you, you're not going to wake up when I, it's, it's programmed. Well, it, it, in part, yes, what I and noticed like over it. lockdown, like yep, yeah. no, I love it actually, yeah. but during, and during lockdown, it shifted slightly, so my, I, I got up later, I got up probably 40 minutes later, and yeah. so everything and you, you was, you might have started to run at like seven or something, there you go, and that to me, what a luxury, yeah. whereas actually, like, I get up, I make coffee, I do 30 to 40 minutes of writing, because that's when yep. I work on client plans, I work on my blog, I work on my um, the online stuff that I have um, kind of going on. And then I, and I feel like I really achieve quite a lot in that short space of time, which is quite yep. nice. It's um, sort of a golden hour, right? 
It is. Yeah. Whereas for you, your goal now clearly is kind of more around that middle point of the day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, like I think there's real advantages to being that lark for that stuff. Like first of yeah. all, as you said, it's celebrated. And yeah. second of all, actually you can do quite a bit. Whereas you've got, you've got periods where it's quiet and you're not going to be interrupted where you're working well. Like I haven't yeah. really got that. It's like I have yeah. a brief period. Like if I'm writing a book, for example, mm. I, I can't be anywhere near my office or anything. I couldn't do anything. Like, no, yeah. work will get done. Um, oh, so, yeah. So, but I can't get up in the morning and do it. Yeah. I have to like do it during the day. That's yeah. the only time yeah. that's available to me where I'm any good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, celebrate the humanity of who you are. Like, it's, it is a thing, eh? Like it's such a thing. It um, is. I agree. Yeah. What about compatib- partner compatibility? How does that go? Well, like, Barry is very good at, <laughs> he's, he calls it doing what he's told, but that is not it. But he is, he's not a morning person, at, so he would naturally get up probably an hour later than me, and he yeah. would naturally exercise at a different time as well. But like, but unlike you, like just with the kids and, and with his work and stuff, like if yeah. he doesn't do it in the morning, he finds it very difficult to find time during the day to do it because his job doesn't lend itself to the flexibility. No, yeah, no, no everyone either. has a, like a professor's job where you don't actually do any actual work. Like you just... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you said it here. Um, yeah. but, um, but he is, um, and he would naturally stay up a bit later, probably yeah. also. Yeah. But he does, what he says to me time and again is that, that he, he's grateful that I get him out of bed is what he says um yeah. so that's good so it, and actually you know in terms of compatibility around that stuff we just move easily around each other and it's not like yeah. it's not yeah right issue. so when but the lockdown when you moved a bit that made it a bit easier on both of you you both didn't oh it was complete yeah totally fine absolutely yeah, fine. That, that was sort of more of a bliss point perhaps yeah yeah which yeah. is I mean who wouldn't like to go back to a bliss point? You just wouldn't want to do it because of a global pandemic where everything was shut down and you couldn't see your mates, basically. Uh, Grant, this is like been an hour now. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's been awesome. Yeah, yeah. Like 10 minutes. Yeah, it's usually like that though, eh? When you kind of, I think I had down about 10 or 15 things that I wanted to talk to you about and we maybe spoke about two of them. Um, that's the beauty of these types of conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Um, it's cool. I hope you someone will listen. Be I, awesome. Well, can you get Louise to listen? And that will be my Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll do that. Yeah, and I'll get Baz to listen. Your Barry to listen. He'll do it. Yeah. Boom. That's like two listeners to Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs>